thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Delighted to have you all here. This is exciting. So quickly, up top, just so you know. Oh, are we bringing in fake applause for this? I don't think we're going to need that. I don't think we're going to need that. That's great for backup, but I appreciate it in case it wasn't going over well. But I, I think we're going to be good. I'm going to head out. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I don't think we're going to need that. I don't think we're going to need that. That's sweet, though. Were they no, nervous? Were they nervous sure. that we wouldn't be able Maybe. to? Okay. That could have happened. Okay. It's like now we're on a like a weird yeah. 80s sitcom. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, every time w that there's a joke, I want canned laughter. That's, yeah. that's what I want. Same. Yeah, right? Same. Yeah, that'll be fun. Like we're on Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> In, with separate beds. <clears throat> so, so I'm Dennis Scully. I am the host of the Business of Home podcast, and I'm also the curator of the Dialogues on Design series here at the New York School of Interior Design. And this whole program is about raising money for scholarships. So. I thank you prematurely for helping to make that possible My and pleasure. for filling this room in the way that you have. So thank you for that. Through subscriptions and sponsorships, these conversations raise money for our various scholarship programs, including our diversity scholarship and our pre-college scholarship program, where we hope to introduce interior design as a career for young people from often underrepresented communities. And I'm grateful to everyone who has helped make this series possible. And I want to give special thanks to Holly Hunt, Kathy Doyle, Andrea Feinstock, Ellen Kravit, Kravit Inc., Peter Penoyer, Cynthia Murphy, and Gil Schaefer. A round of applause for all of that. <clears throat> Their generosity is greatly appreciated by the school and by the students. So. Tonight, look who we have. <laughs> Thank you. He didn't want a big introduction, so I'm right. So I'm gonna, just a big fee. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry did, to all the students David, that were we, up for we this. We took care of that. Yeah. yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Okay. Did it, did it hit the yeah. wire? Great. Yeah. All right, we're, we're good. We got the green Let's light. Let's talk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to make this quick. Okay. okay. All right. So tonight I have the pleasure of speaking with one of the most influential designers in the world. Did you know that? Did you know? I mean, Do you? It's been stated. Well, I don't, I've I don't heard. like act that way at the grocery store, yeah. but thank yeah. you for yeah. great. Yeah. That'll sure. work yeah, for yeah. this venue. I just want to set up the room, you know, so they know the level, mm -hmm. you know, really that we're dealing with. But <laughs> since since starting his award-winning multidisciplinary <clears throat> design firm at the age of 24. Nate has gone on to television stardom, become a best-selling author many times over, and has created product lines and partnerships with a myriad of brands, including several who give generously to the school, Kravitz and the Shade Store among them. His Nate home line is legendary. I'm, I'm hoping some new towels are in my future. <laughs> Let's just see how this goes. We'll talk. You know, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. He's even got a collection for PetSmart, which we're going to talk about. And we're going to learn that uh, it's, it's, it's really opened his mind, right, to, to, to reptiles and to, to pets in, in, in ways he never imagined. I, I don't want them in my house, to be clear. Okay, but so he I, hasn't totally have, warmed up yes. to them, but I mean, yeah, he. Still largely. A, interested in dogs, just to be <laughs> clear with everyone here, yeah. But again, he's keeping an open mind. Yes. And that is the overarching message of this conversation, <clears throat> really, is his open mind, yes. You also received, in 2019, an honorary degree from NYSID, which I feel certain is one of the crowning achievements of your remarkable <laughs> well, career in, it is in your because, mind. No, right? it is. Yeah, I, it I actually, think you felt that way. It really did because I worked very hard to get a four-year bachelor's degree at Lake Forest College in Chicago, and I didn't have to do anything except just come here for that. So it was amazing. <laughs> so I like efficiency. That was the best degree you ever it got. It was insane, and you know I didn't yeah. have to call my father and argue about tuition. It was perfect. So yes, it means a great deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very glad. Will you all just please join me in welcoming Nate Burgess?
<clears throat> so in, in speaking to Nate about where we wanted to go in this conversation, Nate very generously said that he really wants this conversation to be less about him and the life and times of Nate Berkus and more what can he do to be helpful to a room full of students, some designers who are early on in their career, some designers in the room who have left big AD100 firms and gone out on their own in recent years. You, you know who you are out there. You've also got numerous people in this audience, Nate, for whom you are the reason they are in design. I mean, numerous people came up to me. So, so some might even be interning for you at present. Uh, <laughs> and, and, they, and they saw you on television or elsewhere, and they decided, I, I, I want to do what, what he's doing. So you've inspired a, a great many people. And we're, and we're thrilled to, to have you here. Thank and, you. Yeah. And eager to learn what, what you have learned and, and get inside the mind of Nate Berkus a little bit. OK. If we can. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm game. Ask me anything you want. I know. And I love that attitude, yeah. Nate. Go for it. So let's go back to when you were an intern. OK. OK? Because that had a big impact on you. You were interning at a, an auction house. Yep. And, and that is something that has stayed with you your entire career in, in many ways. But, but tell me about the early days for you getting started and, and how, you, how you thought about it. So I think, you know, I'm not sure where I learned this, but what I knew, I didn't know a lot at that age, at, you know, 20 years old when I first started interning for Leslie Heinemann Auctioneers in Chicago. But I think somehow I carried with me into that internship um, a work ethic and a, and a desire and a curiosity to learn everything I could and sort of be um, the person at the table, the youngest, the least experienced, maybe sort of the dumbest, um, and take in everything that I could take in. And there were a lot of lessons from those days. Um, Leslie Heinemann, who owned the company, was a brilliant marketer. So that was a lot to learn. And I watched her market. Uh, uh, she also started her auction house at, at, um, at like 26, I think it was, and then was in the, all the papers and all the magazines and, and, and everything back in the day in Chicago. Um, but she made me do everything I hated all the time. <laughs> And you know, I, I love the auction houses. I, I love Doyle. I love you know. I, I love I love auctions still to this day. And and for my firm, source constantly from them. All probably rooted in my early you know intern days. And then I went on to have my first job there. But I think you know by making me catalog things I had no interest in, mm. like Toby jugs and dolls, and like you know, I sat in the basement for days describing dolls with guidebooks. This was all pre-internet. So I couldn't like just Google, you know, what is this doll? And it would come up with like a value. Um, and I had to learn. And I had to learn how to do that. And it served me so well in so many ways. Um, obviously, the, the skills of being in a, a corporate environment for the very first time. And my eyes were really open to that and how Leslie ran the company and um, how the most effective people in the office became and stayed effective, mm -hmm. um, how people did things and had control over situations, but did it in a way that got everyone on their side. Um, who became the people that you like to be around, no matter what their title was? And that was something that I always wanted to model for myself as I built my own businesses. Did you learn to be so affable from, from watching people that were easy to, to work? Were you always this pleasant is, I guess, really the question. <laughs> um, yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah I was. Okay. But okay. you know what? Here's the thing too, and I think that this is that that's a really that's a really important thing. And 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 you know, I say, don't be a snob. Be rich. Like you know, like just I love be it. rich. I love don't it. be a snob. No yeah. one wants to work with a snob. That's boring. 
you know, even like the top, top designers in the world, um, you know, they have fun. Albert Hadley was the, the most adorable human being in the world. He was. You, there's nobody you'd rather have a glass of wine with. And, um, you know, that, I think that that goes a really, grace goes a really long way in this world, in design, in business, in, in every, you, you want to be the guy that your clients want to have dinner with when you're done with the presentation. And if you're not that person and it doesn't come naturally to you, figure out how to get there. Um, you know, I just think there's so much um, sort of attitude sometimes yeah. um, in the sort of echelons of design and it's just so boring. Really? Like, is yeah. there is there a, a bad attitude in the lofty <laughs> ranks of the interior design like, world? I feel like I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one that's noticed it. I can't believe <laughs> that. Shocking. I, I, but you know, I mean, yeah. you, I, there's a lot of people I admire and and for their skill and for their talent, and a lot of people that I've met and and I know personally and big yeah. big names and all of that. But the people that resonate, and the, I think the work, even the opportunity to get the work that resonates, is if you position yourself as somebody that people want to be around. Yeah. And um, and that's really something that isn't you know exclusively about business, but it certainly I think has helped. Yeah, no, 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 no question. And, and one of the things that I that I said to to Nate in our earlier conversations was that I very much wanted to speak to Nate Burkus, the the businessman, as much as I want to speak to the interior designer tonight, because Nate is a very savvy businessman and, and develop those skills over time. So many of those snobby people in the design world that we were talking about earlier, yeah. yeah. So many of them, Nate, they have this notion that you just showed up and one day Oprah Winfrey put you on TV and la, la, la. Yeah. You just cakewalked into some career. And I did. It was amazing. Yes. They're all so they're all so mad. Um, they're still mad 40 years later. They are. So, they're so bitter. I, 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 no, but you know, it was not a no, cakewalk at all. No, it was not. No. So tell them the truth. Tell no. them what really happened. So what really happened was when I met Oprah's producers and they asked me to do a, a segment on the show. It was a small space makeover in Boston. It was the very first one. Oprah, they, the producers, you know, tried to show it to her before this it aired, or an, or it taped, and she said, "No, I want to see it with the audience." And the question that she asked the producers afterwards, because it was a really great moment, and you know, obviously, I'll never forget it. And she lifted my hand up and she said, "Nate Burkus, remember his name." And I, I was like, "Oh my God, what's happening right now?" <laughs> um, um, but she asked, "How was he to work with?" How, you know, how, how was it? How was it on location? Mm. Um, you know, and Jenna Kostelnik, who was my producer from that episode for 15 years of being part of the Oprah Winfrey show every month almost, said to Oprah, he slept on the floor of the laundry room. Um, you know, and, and we, he, you know, we, he walked onto the, into the room and, and the cameras were there two hours later and he got two hours of sleep. And we taped for seven hours, and um, then we flew home. And she said, OK, good to know. And I thought to myself at that moment that I could never rest on my laurels mm. with that opportunity. If you think about the Oprah Winfrey show, it was on every day for 25 years. Mm. How many people got that chance to walk onto that set, whether they made a milkshake or a bra, or we're a designer, or a hairstylist, or whatever. And how many people stayed for 15 years with the same production team? And the only reason why, I think, I mean, the work was fun. Mm. That was, pre, again, pre-internet. I would call companies and ask them if I could have a sofa for a makeover, and they'd say no. And I was like, OK, I mean, moving on. <laughs> I said, get the folks from Ballard Designs on the line. Um, but it was, it, was, it, it was a really interesting time, because we, we really kind of together kind of developed makeovers on daytime television. It wasn't really out there that much. And we had to figure out systems and how to get local um, plumbers and electricians in all these different markets, because we were constantly on the road. Um, so it was a fascinating time for me, and a lot of opportunities came from it. Um, but I never once rested on my laurels. I always treated the next makeover as if it were my first. I was always the last person to leave. I was always tweaking the picture frame or, you know, punching the pillow. Um, 
or folding the throw right before the cameras rolled. And it really wasn't about design as much as it was about connecting with people. Mm. And that has stayed with me, you know, forever. It's part of everything that I do. Um, it's my responsibility in licensing. It's my responsibility for the show that Jeremiah, my husband and I host. Um, it's not really ever about the design. That's sort of the vehicle we get to talk about love and connection. Which is, which is an important part of what you talk about, love and connection. And, and I wanted to talk about this image, this, this beautiful image of, of you and your, your husband and your, and your family. Sure. And, and I feel like this is such an important part of how you present yourself in the, in the world and, and, and a beautiful part of, of how you come at the world. So, so t tell us what this means to, to you. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, I grew up in suburban Minneapolis um, and Southern California. And when I was growing up, there was nobody that looked like that, no families that looked like that on TV or on the cover of magazines. Um, and so when I look at that image, um, that is our kitchen um, here in New York City. But it was, you know, I see obviously the love and the connection that I have for my husband, the fact that this was probably our most important collaboration to date, but those two little people are by, by far you know, more important than anything either one of us has, has ever really accomplished. And I think he would agree if he was, but you didn't invite him, which is also no, great. No, no, and, I, and I, feel, I feel badly about that. No, he's you fine. Know, but he got I mean, in at two in the morning. Yeah, he would have been no, grumpy and, yeah. right? Grumpy. No. Um, but you know, it's, it's funny because when I first moved to New York City, I used to walk down Lower Fifth Avenue and I used to look at the top of these Emory Roth and 1920s buildings and I used to think to myself, I wonder who lives there? Like who, do you, who lives there? And now we do. And we do as a family that's been welcomed not only by the city but by the media and by you know um, many things. And we're very much base level grateful for that. That's the whole reason we do the HGTV show. Um, you know, I think at this time in the world where everything is so complicated and so divided, the visibility that we have as a family, the fact that we're you know sitting on your sofa watching a TV show is a really easy way to meet people who don't have anything in common with you. Yeah. And it's a really easy way to present a family that, um, that doesn't look like yours and a love that doesn't look like yours. And so I think that's what I see when I see that image. And then I think how I'm the only person that knows how to clean that kitchen properly. <laughs> D despite the complaints I hear about the, about the breakfast that you serve. Yeah, my kids which... say, yeah, Jeremiah is like uh, unbelievable. The kids, like when he travels for work, it is a disaster. <laughs> Our daughter, Poppy, who's eight years old, said to him last night when he came home from California, or this morning when he came home, um, you know, Daddy gets so stressed out in the morning, and he can't get either. We don't have the right socks. And, he <laughs> and then he makes us eggs that taste like nothing. And I was like, yep, you're right. But you know what you have? Dental insurance. So <laughs> keep smiling. And I'm the reason for that. Exactly. Yeah. I put that plan together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Nate. I, I, I spoke to your husband, as you as you know, yeah. he and I spent a bunch of time just last week, and I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to your husband at, at NYSID next week. And he said, yeah, you, sh you should really lower your expectations. <laughs> he said, yeah, don't, don't count on it. He's don't an idiot. He's, he's, he really, he yeah. was he, you know, he wasn't sure this was going to go, go, uh, go well. A thousand percent. Yeah. He's badly spoken. He's unclear. Yeah. And yeah. I think most yeah. people who have met him would agree with that. It's, so. it's that getting up at 4.30 in the morning thing that he Ugh. does, right? How can yeah. he be clear-headed when he's I wouldn't I mean, get he's up sleep at, deprived? I wouldn't get up at 4.30 in the morning oh. if I was boarding a flight to Asia. Wouldn't like, there is no, we have very distinct differences. Yeah. So. Couldn't pay me enough. Nope. No. But I want to go back to to be here, the family, the cover of Architectural Digest, in the, in the early days when you were starting your firm. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you ever have imagined that and all of this? Was that in your thinking? What, what, what were your big goals and aspirations early on for you? 
You know, I, to be honest, I did not know. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do career-wise. I knew I loved design. My mother's an interior designer, so I grew up carrying those old big wallpaper books in and out of the trunk of her car, um, which was great because, you know, that's fitness. Um, <laughs> sure. It's a good but, workout. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. It's like no trainer needed, just yeah. unload the back of mother's trunk. Um, but I will say, though, that um, I wasn't really ever strategic business-wise. I didn't have like a plan that was very linear. Oh, if I could get on Oprah, then I could write a book and sell napkins at linens and things and get on the cover of Architectural Digest and live in a penthouse. It didn't occur to me that way. What I did, what did occur to me was that I was grateful mm. from the very beginning for every opportunity and I put my best foot forward with anything that came my way. And luckily, because it sounds like I've made all these like such esteemed decisions on my own. Yes. But luckily, from a very very early on, I had an amazing team of people around me that I really trusted. A business manager, an attorney who I just had dinner with the other night, who I who you know works for an amazing firm here in in New York City and is like a genius owl of a person. Um, it's fascinating how his mind works. Um, and, and he was, he, he's been, my, my account's been my accountant, my attorney's been my attorney, I did switch managers, but, um, you know, it, 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 was, it was me being, being sort of given all these, having all these options and these choices out of nowhere, really. Mm. Um, and it, I had to learn what to say no to, you know, and there were a lot of offers. So there were way more no's than there were yeses. And part of that was just my own instinct. Mm. And then part of it was my team saying to me, it's not a good look. I know it's a lot of money, but it's, it's not. If you want to still be here, if you want to be asked to you know, sit in this chair at night, sit 100 years from now, yeah. don't take the money and sit on a toilet at a home improvement convention. Mm. Okay. Might not be a great okay. plan. So it was what to say no to, and it was definitely strategic about what to say yes to. But I just wanted whatever I said yes to to be the best it could be in in that climate, and um, and then things just led to another. So tell me the early days of building the design firm with all of this focus and attention on you and. Well, the early days there wasn't focus and attention on me. Yeah. It was a time in Chicago that was really special. Um, it was Bruce Grega who had, was the reigning king of design in Chicago, um, and. There were, you know, iconic people living there at the time. The photographer Victor Skrivnetsky, whose interior is one of the most incredible spaces still to this day. You guys should all look at it online. Um, not but, now, but no, later. No, yeah, no, like yeah. maybe in ten minutes. Mm. Um, but it was it was so um, interesting because I started my design firm and I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't have a formal education in design. I had a sociology and French degree. I started in the basement of my house. The biggest investment I made was, I think it was $130 to print up like sort of crappy business cards. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted to work for myself. I knew that I, I could work for myself and I trusted in my resourcefulness enough to figure out like, I'll, I'll, I'll develop relationships with vendors. I'll find out when a, one of my first clients said to me, don't you think we should do a wall of built-in millwork on this wall? And I said, yeah, I think that would be amazing. I went to Ralph Lauren, the Ralph Lauren store in Chicago, and I said, who did your mill work? So, you know, I just had to be really scrappy and try and figure it out um, while it was all really happening. But the Oprah effect didn't happen until years later. Yeah. I, you know, I already thought I was really cool. I had like an apartment above Saks and a convertible <laughs> and a house in Michigan. I was like, wow. <laughs> um, and then um, met the producers of, of, of that show. In the, in the early days, tell me about thinking about hiring and, and building a team when you were first getting started, because that's what, that's what so many people are trying to figure out. Right? Yeah, right? I, you know, my philosophy, and this works for me, and it, I'm, I hope it works for other people, but my own philosophy was to build a team with people that you really like, number one. Mm who have skills that you don't necessarily have strengths in, and then be really honest when you're assessing that team about who's good at what and who's not good at what and make that be okay in a corporate environment. Like I had 
people who were terrible with rugs. So I never ha asked them to pull rugs or terrible with scale, mm. but they were unbelievable with sourcing vintage lighting and antiques. And so I always kind of looked around and was like, remembering me in the basement of the auction house trying to catalog Biscad dolls and thinking to myself, I so I, I didn't that that's past that phase. I was an intern. You know, these people are now starting out working in their careers with me. I need to highlight what they're really naturally talented in and excuse them for what they're not with no penalty. And that's how I've built my my company since day one. And people seem to stay with you for a long time. Yeah, I've got very little turnover, which makes me so happy. That's like eighteen years and you know, 20 years and 14 years. Um, and I'm not always this like affable, by the way. I get stressed no, out. Like, no. there's like, we have, see, Aaron Neely, who, yeah. who sits next to me every day. She's like, no, he's actually we'll a jerk. I'll you all later um, to get the real story. Come on, yeah. Aaron, go for it. Um, but no, I mean, it, you know, listen, it really, it, in terms of like governing philosophies of what I think matters, I think people want to be seen, I think they want to be heard, and I think that that's true at any level of entry level to clients to, um, you know, you name it. Yeah. And I loved building my company. I loved it. And we took everybody to this summer camp in Wisconsin as a retreat last summer. And it was so gross because the lake was like filled with seaweed and whatever. <laughs> um, it really was so gross. Erin wouldn't even put her toe in. I offered to buy her whatever <laughs> bag she wanted if she put her leg in the water to her knee for 10 seconds and she pulled her leg out at three. Could have been anything, Chanel, you name it. She couldn't do it. Um, I, you, you were, well, you guys were like drunk and swimming. But, um, but you know, the, the interesting thing for me was, um, you know, we're doing archery and we're having these great dinners that Kelly Engstrom organized and all this stuff. And we had this like wonderful, wonderful time. And I just looked around and saw how much everybody really likes each other. And that is something that you can't craft as a boss or a business owner. Yeah. You, you can try, you can curate, like curating a great dinner party or a, a great you know, salon, but you can't really do it when people are coming in every day and dealing with stressful situations and dealing with workloads and all of that and communication constantly. Um, so when you know, we've got that formula somehow, mm. which, you know, which, is, which is really special. Well, and which in, in in many ways, you didn't really see modeled because you, you really didn't get a chance to work for another design firm. No, right? never. And so uh, yeah, I yeah. didn't see that, but I did see it at the auction house. Okay. And I did watch, and I was like, I did, I did, I, I bore witness to um, the the strength of watching people do what they're really good at and really enjoying it. There's no substitute for that. It's really a it's a pleasure. You know, that's yeah. a real pleasure in life. Because one of the things that you and I have spoken about in the past is trying to encourage young people, especially design students, designers in general, to, to, to go work Absolutely. for another firm and, and, and to learn under someone. So 100%. Tell me, tell me your thoughts about that. You know, I just think that it's really important um, to go at least go try and work for another firm, whether it's as an, as an intern or as a design assistant or whatever it is, um, just so that you can get a grip on the culture and make decisions about culturally what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, you know, I think that obviously every firm is different. Um, every culture of every company is really quite different. But not having any experience in leadership in that way or, or even being led by anybody and, and not understanding what that dynamic feels like, I think you're making it harder on yourself to just go out and start your own, your own firm. Um, I love an internship. I love a, a entry level job. I love, you know, and I think what I would say to the students is that, you know, don't squander the opportunity. You may be there and you may be in the sample room, but trust me, people notice how you put those fabric swatches away. And people notice if you really care about it or if you're just dialing it in and you can't wait to get to meet your friends down at the park. Like, you know, we hire so often from within, from yeah. our interns that we adore, from design assistants that come in, um, because we know them. And it's, you know, we, we see that, you know, it, it, 
it matters. You know, as an intern, I would go and get people ice cream cones, you know, in the summer and like come back. But, you know, I made sure to bring extra napkins and I made sure, you know, and it just, <laughs> it's, it's, it just, it, if you approach every single thing that you do thoughtfully um, with a sense of pride, um, that's, 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 that's noted, you know, that's really, that's not squandering an internship, not squandering a first job. Even if the job's not right for you, you never know. You never know those connections and what will happen. Well, I'm, I'm pleased that you have several NYSED graduates working for you. Some are still NYSED students that, yep. are, that are working for you as, as well. And, and Jeremiah does too, if I remember. Yep. Uh, and, and Holly, Holly Hayden, right Holly here, Hayden is the professor at yes. NYSED and she runs Jeremiah's company. Yes. So that's exciting. And he raves about you, Holly. He raves about you. Not to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> to you? But to, to me, he does. But I, what, I, what I'm curious about is how you think about hiring, what you look for. You know, when, when, when students are, are graduating and they're coming out, what, you know, tell, me, tell me what you're looking for in a good hire. I look for, uh, well, first of all, I don't hire everybody anymore because I don't work with them mm. on a daily basis. So I trust my team to hire. And then I do one cursory interview if they've made it past all these people. <laughs> if they've made it past um, the Because that is no yeah. small feat. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the direction is we, we like people with um, a really strong work ethic, a deep curiosity, um, people who, you know, it's normal to be nervous in an interview, but can you channel those nerves into asking really important questions like, tell me about the culture of this company. Mm. Like, I've, I don't think I've ever not hired anyone who's asked us that question. I'm like, yeah, you, you want to know? <laughs> um, I think the, um, how will I be, people who ask things like, how will I be judged on my performance? Um, people who show like a true interest, no matter what level they're coming into the company, I think is really important. Um, and also, I love strong personal style. I'm just like, I'm a sucker for it. It may not be, you know, it may not be the style of the firm, and that's fine, but I love um, a, a look, an attitude, a, a lipstick, a hairstyle, a, I, I love it. I think it's, it's what makes us all tick, how we express ourselves. Um, so I, I don't like when people sort of dumb down their individuality for an interview. Mm. I like when they come as who they are, and you get to meet them in that way and you get to sort of discern things about them personally from how they present themselves. Um, but I, I mean, I really, like, I, I don't even know how long it's been since I've actually at, said, you're hired. Like, well, it's, it's, it's sort of everyone else. So related to that, mm -hmm. I, I, think it was, I think it was in 2019 when you officially named your, your partner at the firm. Yeah, Lauren Buxbaum. Right, yeah. Lauren Buxbaum. Tell me about that decision and, and, and what led up to that and, and what made you feel that that was the time to, to make that decision? You know, it was, an, it was interesting. It was, um, I had actually never really even considered it. Lauren and I have worked together for almost 20 years. For ages, yeah. right? And yeah. it never really occurred to me and Lauren had never asked and we moved into this like such a comfortable like state, literally like an old, like Lucy and Desi, like, you know, Separate yeah. beds, but like so comfortable with each other, like <laughs> unbelievable. And she ran the company and ran the Chicago office. And for many years when I was doing the talk show or dating someone in Milan or whatever my life was doing, she kept that company up and running and she was so talented and skilled at doing so. Um, and we grew up together. Mm. You know, she went to University of Michigan with my little sister. Like, you know, there was that kind of familiarity. And, um, and then... We, she came to New York, I think it was for a party for El Decor, and we were with a bunch of PR folk, mm. and they said, why isn't Lauren your partner? And I said, do you want to be my partner? <laughs> and she said, I mean, yeah, I guess. Like, what does it mean? I go, you get to do the same thing, but you get to say your partner. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, should I get you like a Birkin or something? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, I should have that right now. Yeah. Can it be? Yeah. I'm like, it's not a skin. Don't start. I know you. It's not going to be alligator. So keep on moving. But <laughs> um, but it was it was you know it, it literally the conversation was like that. And I think you know it was interesting to see 
not for me because I've only I've only had the utmost respect and admiration and love and and for her creativity and and everything about her as a person, as a mother, as a designer, as everything. Um, but it was interesting to see what it meant to everyone else. Mm. And so, um, from a sociological standpoint, it was a really interesting move. And now I have a tremendous amount of pride when she and I are sitting at an event or we're at a dinner or we're on a plane going to visit a project or whatever, and I say, and this is my partner, Lauren, Gord Lauren Buxbaum Gordon. And then Jeremiah says, phew. Yeah. You see, he doesn't have to. Yeah, he's like, great. Right. You can be the partner, I'll be the husband. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good to have that, that clear division. Yeah. Decent. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But she, um, but you know, it was, it was, I'm really, really like, I, 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 I wish I could say, oh, I wish I would have done it years earlier. It, we just didn't even think about it. Right. Like we just were heads down at our desks doing what we're meant to be doing. And, um, and um, you know, I, it sounds like I don't care about incentivizing people, which isn't the well, case. Well, I didn't want to say, Nate, yeah, but well, I mean, um, I... Right. She's never had a raise, too, Well, by I way, wondered. I mean, she's not here um, to tell us yeah, the real no story. No commission, no raise. It's been yeah, great no. uh, for her. It's, I, 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 she would I come, imagine. but she can't afford well, the flight, so... I, yeah. Sorry, she can't be here. Um, she had to pawn the Birkin bag, yeah, said, right? She did. She's yeah. carrying a fake one now, yeah, and you know, she probably bought food with the money for her children. Yeah, is yeah. my guess. It, it sounds that's like my, it hasn't been easy. My great guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it didn't. It wasn't your way of telling us that that was some kind of big transition, or that was no, some... not at all. I'm not tired. I'm not out of ideas. Um, you know, I have a wonderful relationship with my dermatologist, so mm. if I feel mm. like, if as long as I clearly, can keep it clearly. together, we can see we that. We try lots of new yeah. things every yeah. month. It's great. Yeah. She's like, what about if we take this person's mm. blood? I'm like, do it. Great. Um, <laughs> the, um, let's try it. Yeah. I agree. I'm on it. No, yeah. I'm not out of ideas. I'm not yeah. moving. I'm not okay. selling the firm to her. I'm not, that's none of that. I, um, you know, it's if, just because someone brought it up at a cocktail party? Yeah, and, like, okay. I'm telling you, like, I All think right. we might have been in an Uber, okay. and I probably had a couple of tequilas, as did she, and that, you know, and now she's my partner. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's, let's get back to your home life okay. for a second. Uh, so you moved back, you moved back home, yeah. right? You yeah. did a little, little reno. Yeah. Right? And... Um, Lovely. I mean, the whole point of this, these are the same yeah. rooms, obviously, but the reason that, that we put mm. these slides in for our very right. esteemed talk yes. is because um, I, wanted, I wanted you to just point out that your style is going to change, guys. Like, especially, your, you're like, it is going to evolve, it's going to change. Like, if you go back one, like, yeah. Yeah. That, so, I thought I mean, that that was our kitchen, and it right. was like, the, I loved that kitchen, it was like the best kitchen. I still don't dislike it, but, um, you know, there's an evolution. And, and, and the time between the two? Uh, seven years. Seven years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Seven years. Okay. Um, so, you know, same room, seven years later, uh -huh. two more heartbeats in the house, obviously. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the dining room, the same thing. Like, I was like, that was in AD too. Um, and I was like, isn't that the best designed room anyone's ever seen in their <laughs> lives? Look at that weird sort yeah. of abacus we found at the Paris flea market. We're the chicest that people I've ever yes, met. You're so cool. And then now it's and this. Now it's and this. Now, right, and so maybe nine it's years so later, different. I'll be like, look at this weird mirror. But, yeah. um, you know, it, you're, yeah. uh, the point is, is that like even for me and for Jer, like, you know, our tastes change and it does evolve. And I think as designers, it's so important for us to like keep our eyes open and stay curious and, and take inspiration from travel and other people's work and and galleries and all of these things and so you know this is the most recent iteration of our home um we are out of money as it relates to this re renovation so that is, is that, what it's going to look like is that right so that's gone, that's going to stick for a minute for a yeah limit? okay yeah, those dining chairs really put me over the edge so. yeah they they that was our bedroom and in all fairness jer has always said we have never gotten our bedroom right Never. So, th so this is the before bit. That was before. And now? Now it's that, which, oh. is, which feels a lot better. And, it, and is he happy with this? Yeah, he loves this. OK. He, it was done with, this, with white walls. And he like came in one night, and he was like, would you ever? Never mind. It's like, you're never going to say you never. And I was like, 
what? And he was like, I think this wallpaper would be unbelievable in our bedroom. And I was like, no. <laughs> it's weird. What is it? Yeah. It's like some sort of bucolic, like, is there a shepherdess somewhere in it? <laughs> and he was like, I think it's amazing. And then it went in, because that's how things work in our house as well. You say, you say no, and then he does it. And okay. it was like the, he's yeah. like, that's interesting, because uh -huh. they're unrolling it right now in the hallway. <laughs> um, and, um, and I love waking up in it every morning so much. Like, I can't, it's oh. so, it's so like sort of the, yeah. the polar opposite of a Manhattan sort of high rise bedroom, um, but it, 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 I wake up every day and feel like I'm in Portugal, it's, 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 and then make the kids eggs that taste like nothing. Yeah, and then the kids, <laughs> and then the kids complain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is just, I threw these in because this is new work that no one's ever seen before. Yeah. So these are on the desks of editors right now, but I wanted to share it with everybody here. So don't share these with yeah. anyone, okay? It, well, yeah, because I need the press guys, so yeah. just keep yeah. it confidential. Yeah, because he's, um, he's trying to build the name recognition. I'm pitching here. Um, but this, this is a project, literally, we just installed a matter of weeks ago. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I, it, this is sort of where the firm is now. Mm. I guess that's how I would best describe it. That was here in New York, um, very classic apartment for a, a family, young family, and we had to figure out how to do, that table splits and you can do six chairs at it, and the other two chairs are flanking a, a chest, but it's sort of like, elevated one room living, if you will. And all their things for entertaining is in that armoire. That's in Minnesota, where I grew up, mm. um, for really, really lovely client. Um, this is recent as well. LA. Can you guess? They're in the film industry. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait, shocker. <laughs> Um, and this is one of my favorite rooms ever. My favorite main bedrooms, actually, we've ever designed. The angle is a little weird. The bed's not a doll bed, but um, but I love the pieces in here. And you know, one of the tenants of my firm mm. has been, you know, I'm a dealer on first dibs. I resell things. I come from an auction background. Yeah. It's a really hard time with reproduction furniture. Mm. I'd much rather have something old or vintage than, and I sell furniture, at, you know, living spaces and everything but it's not meant to look like something that's, mm. you know, 18th century or 19th century or 1940s. And it's been, what's fun and why I included this is just that um, they've moved three times since they lived in this bedroom. And now that bed's in a guest room and that gilded mirror is in a hallway and that chest of drawers is in an entry and that, that pair of amazing lamps is on the dining room console. But I think it's like that old adage, like buy once, buy well. And you know they didn't know they were going to move every two years. Yeah. And they, you know, we we just keep adding to their collection of furniture, and I love working that way. Well, and and I know that you're you're quite acquisitive. On, Super. Online. Yeah. And, oh yeah. I mean, you mean perhaps to, is this the intervention? Well, part I of mean, this? I can we <laughs> can we can we share with the go for it? I mean, yeah. I just like, I just know that like. You know, I, I've had an intervention of from live auctioneers. Yeah, is what yeah. my my people closest to me came to me and said, and Dennis and I were talking about this, but they they said that um, it's embarrassing <laughs> um, that just because I think I know what I'm buying, that I don't always. Mm. That I'm spending way too much money, and I'm like, no, it's research. No, it's for resale. But um, there was like not an auction internationally that went by that I didn't scroll through all 750 lots, basically. And you know, it, it's so I'm I'm kind of I'm weaning myself yeah. off of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not not all at once, right? It, no, you can't go cold turkey. Well, no, I, I mean, mean I'll but get you got the it. Shakes. No, no, yeah, of course. It's not gonna work. Yeah, but you do. I mean, you do have a presence on first dibs, and you do have. I mean, we do, Kelly. We make money doing that. Yeah, <laughs> like we do. <laughs> We buy things. Back me I'm up on like this, crazy. Kelly. Back me up. No, but we, yeah. we do. I buy things at auction all yes. the time, and I love doing that. And I and we'll recover them and recondition them and then put them on first dibs, and that's right. a really fun part of my business. What I'm definitely prohibited from buying on a, online any longer, thanks to my girlfriend Marjorie Gubelman and my husband, is jewelry. I am mm. not permitted to buy jewelry for our daughter online under any circumstances anymore. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah, because I've made some real 
Weird moves. Some bad, <laughs> some bad purchases. Real weird moves. Some bad purchases. Yeah. I, I bring it up in part just because I, I wanted you to get it off your chest about the intervention, but also. Thank you. Uh, I feel be- Do you guys feel don't, better? Don't feel you feel better? better? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was my hope. But I also know that it's important to you, and you think it ought to be important to others in the design industry, 100%. to have a deep well of knowledge. 100%. Right? And that was my direction during the pandemic to my, to my teams in three cities. I said to them, I, I'll worry about keeping the company going. You know, Lucky us, design became the largest focus and the growth in the design industry right. during the pandemic and post-pandemic has been staggering. Mm. But we didn't know that. Mm. Um, and I said to everybody, um, be, become experts. Get online. I didn't have that when I was your age or yeah. your phase. Um, if you're drawn to f- Swedish furniture, I want you to be the expert in Swedish furniture. I want you to be able to go work for Christie's tomorrow if you needed to. So tell me about what paint colors were used, what the paint was made of. Tell me what Gustavian was, what the inside of the you know carcass of the chest of drawers would be. Um, tell me if you love Italian lighting from the 1940s to the 1960s. I want to know, and I want you to know, who were the top 30 designers, not the top three that anyone can find, but who was, who was working when, in what period that you're drawn to. And we did it. We like, everybody was like, no, actually, you know what? We should use Marco Zanuso. And I was like, right. Let me just. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see who that is, yeah. Um, but, you know, it made us better. And I think that that curiosity is really huge. Like, you know, you should, you, people really, um, there's respect that comes with that. And it's not, and, it, and, it, and it's, you know, I, I don't think everyone's meant to be an expert in everything, and that's not possible, and, and I get it. But if you're really passionate about something, don't you want to know, like, more about it? If you, you know, don't, don't you want to, and, and that information so easily accessed, access now, it's just, it's like, and, and so that's, I think it's huge to remain curious like that and to continue to learn constantly. Yeah. Well, tell us about the Sunset Bar. So this was um, a space that I designed on two cruise ships for celebrity cruises. And it was my very first time being asked um, to design anything on a ship. And it was my very first time doing it. Um, we learned an unbelievable amount. They gave me uh, a tri-level space at the very back of the, I say boat, and then they all yell at me. The brand yells at me. It's like, it's a ship. I'm like, OK. Um, I'm like, is there frozen yogurt? Are we good here? Can we move on? Um, but it, it was, I walked the, I was the design ambassador for Celebrity Cruises, which was really a PR thing. And they wanted me to get the message out that they hired this incredible architect who designed the Burj Dubai to design their main hall. And Kelly Hoppin was designing all the guest rooms and they wanted that messaging out. And so they hired me to get that messaging out. And then I was walking with the CEO, Lisa Lutoff Perlo the only woman CEO of an international cruise line still. Hmm. Um, And we were walking through the first of the Edge series ships that I did not have a design project on. And we got to the back. It was unbelievable. Like, I mean, it was unbelievable. Like there was, you know, the food, the shopping, the the grand hall, like it, it really was a feat. And I knew nothing about maritime design at all. And we walked through the whole thing, and Kelly was there from London, and, uh, and everyone was there from everywhere, and Juan Mancou was there from Paris. And we were walking it all together, and we got to the back of the ship, which is an unobstructed view of, I guess, wherever you might find yourself. And um, there was like a guy selling hot dogs like in a thing. And I was like, Lisa, I feel like this might be a missed opportunity. <laughs> I don't know. Look around. I'm sure the hot dog's delicious. Mm. I'm not not commenting on that. But um, why isn't this like the destination? And so basically the the impetus behind the design of the Sunset Bar was me taking everything I could remember and every image of all these beach clubs from South America and Mexico and Europe that 
you want to go and like you kind of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like you don't kind you don't really go in your bathing suit. You go in your bathing suit with a cover up and an earring. Like that was my, you know, you stop and put on lipstick. Like that was what we did. And um, it has this great vibe, and it's the most popular place on both ships. And um, you know, and that that means something to me because it was our first venture into doing that. Love that. Now we're gonna we're gonna jump into towel selling. Towels. Does anyone need a new yeah. set of towels? Well, I mean, I'm just um. saying. I I do. Going and, once, um, going twice. Yeah. But I want to talk about licensing. And I, and I want to talk about this whole other side of you that you've, that you've built. And, and, and as we talked about briefly in the intro, you've got this wide ar array. What's going on here? You've got that's, a, that's outdoor spaces for a new, newly concepted um, Great Wolf Lodge resort in the Poconos. Yeah. Oh. And we've got living spaces with the two of you. And Beauty rest mattresses. Mattresses and Pet Smart, which I know you love to talk about. Well, I, 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 I do, reptile I, cages. I do want to talk about this. Pet cages. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us the story of how this even came to be. That the, the takeaway from this story, just to preface yes. the whole story with the takeaway first, is that this is what I mean when I say that life and work and creativity can be relationship-based. I wasn't telling my management teams and agents, can you please connect me with PetSmart? Like that was not coming out of my mouth, as you may well imagine. Um, but what happened was Stacia Anderson, who ran the program that I was a part of for many years at Target, left Target and went to Abercrombie and then moved to Arizona where PetSmart is based. And we got a phone call one day and she said, would you and Jeremiah ever consider making environments for and furniture for um, animals? <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. Promptly, <laughs> no. Yeah. No. And Jeremiah said, well, wait, babe, let's, you know, Let's talk. And I was like, Stacia, I mean, come on. Like, you know, you know I'm not gonna do anything that's like a one-off thing. I'm, we're not gonna put our name on three pieces on a floor in PetSmart that's the size of a football stadium. So if we were to do something, it would have to be really extensive and it would have to be very impactful. And I don't even know that that's what you're really calling to offer about, because she was asking us to design that, the, you know, the, mm. the, the cabinet that it sits on and whatever. And so she said, well, you know, I get that, and I understand that. And um, she's like, well, let me just ask you one question. She goes, that's fine. We could build out the line. There's all the stuff that goes inside, the, the, the little fake shearling sofas, the little <laughs> hides, the little. And I said, um, Jeremiah said, I, I think it sounds like fun. And what, what we both realized on that call was that you know, a lot of design folk and brands have played in dog and cat. Martha, you name it, leashes, bulls, pet beds, all of that. But no one in the design community, externally from, you know, apart from the internal sort of design teams at, at retailers and, and manufacturers, had ever been asked to apply their point of view to, a, to that category. And how often in life do you have the opportunity to do something entirely new? with no expertise, and they're asking you for just your take on it. And so we worked with our teams internally who were amazing, and we were like, okay, well, if we need like something for one of those things with long nails to scratch, like where do we get that? Like where's the inspiration coming from? And Jerry and I had just returned from Paris with Poppy, and I was like, what about Brancusi's studio? And we were like, right. We're not infringing on anyone's rights, sure. creating something that a salamander's gonna eat or whatever, like, and it's this big. So let's, and we can work in limestone and we can work in pumice stone, which looks like limestone, and we can work in wood and, and, and all of these substrates and materials that we like. So we took a crack at it and it's been an amazing success. It's a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Even like the little bugs they eat is, are like a multi-billion dollar, I can't even believe how many, 
Drew Barrymore had us on her show. She was so thrilled about it because she has a bearded dragon with her daughter. <laughs> like that's her pet, among other pets. But I was like, I was like, what? Like they were like, yeah, you've booked on Drew Barrymore about the, you know, and she really wants you to leave the whole range because she's got her own bearded dragon. And we were like, no problem. <laughs> um, so I'm still afraid of them. Yes, clearly. I'm still afraid yeah. of, you know, I'm Jewish. Yeah. I'm sort of afraid of all those things. Yeah. But I, um, but I, um, but I, I really loved working on this, and it was really, really fun, and it was a really fun collaboration. Now we're going into dog and cat. But we wanted to do something first with them. Um, but it really was about the relationship. And it was really about one person who I loved and admired and who loved and admired me from many years ago who picked up the phone and thought, let's shake this up. And so we couldn't say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and it, it seems like it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge it market. It was. You, you know, you never know. I mean, you know, I'm not a big cruiser either, in all honesty. You know, I, and, and, and Lisa Lutoff Perlo and her head of marketing at the time flew to LA when I was living there to convince me to be part of Celebrity. And I sound like I'm so difficult to hire, I'm not. Um, just with lizards and, you know, kennel cough. Um, but it was, you know, and it, we just had such a great connection. And I believed what she stood for as a company. She hired the first African woman to work on the bridge of any ship ever in the history of maritime. Um, the she raised the percentage of women that are working on, on, on celebrity cruises. It's triple what the industry average was. Um, we were aligned politically. I loved her. Yeah. You know, I was like, tell me, put me in. Do me, do, tell me what I get to do. Yeah. After I got off the phone with you last yeah. night, so I go online to PetSmart, yeah. and there is the sweetest picture in the world that you have ever seen little Luca, the Russian tortoise, <laughs> on this sofa. Yeah. <laughs> and Luca's owner wrote a review yeah. thanking you mm -hmm. for this sofa yeah. for his little Russian tortoise yeah. who's, who's never been happier. But, but you know what? <laughs> and I just have to say, if there's one thing that people take away from this talk, yes. you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the animal kingdom too now. I mean, he's just, that's he's how touching, it works. He's just you know, touching lives. The that's scary part is. That, <laughs> the scary part is, is that yeah. the, the, the actual proper, like, person-sized version of that sofa is Danish from the 1960s, and it's in our house in Montauk. So it didn't come out of nowhere. We were like, let's just shrink it. Let's just yeah. shrink everything. Yeah. Let's make it tiny, guys. And the little I mean, Russian tortoise mm -hmm. was just so yep. happy. How do they know that he's Russian? On that little, he's got an accent. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's really just enhancing. And the, and the reptile, I mean, you've got all these yeah. plants. And the photo got, shoot was my team's, like, favorite day. Because I just stood in the corner freaking out. There was like an animal handler. There was a boa constrictor. There was like a, a thousand things I would never touch. Yeah. I saw you holding the rabbit. I that saw was you were willing to thing. hold the and rabbit. And you know what? He had weird claws. Yes. That were really sharp. They're, you know, they're they actually were very, hard to hold. They were not, yeah, that wasn't nothing holding the rabbit. So I don't, I'm not sure if I appreciated your tone. <laughs> Oh, that's uh, a throwback, right? Yeah, I mean, that was for Target yeah. um, when we launched Baby, and it was so awesome because, you know, it's interesting. Retailers are smart now, and consumers are even smarter or as smart. And um, there's got to be some sort of organic connection. Mm. Like, you know, the PetSmart thing was hard, but we figured out that it was like the connection would be like we could design into a category that no one had touched before. So that was became the 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 my own internal tagline. This our daughter would was born six months prior. So you know you know I sat behind a desk and gone to factories in Vietnam and Mexico and everywhere in California and whatever and reviewed samples and products. But when this stuff came in, this was like a moment. It was so fun to do. Yeah. I'm planting a seed. We're going to have someone come around with a microphone. We don't have that much time, but lovely Karen in the back with microphone in hand is going to come 
for, for anyone that might have questions. I know these are huge partners. Great for partners, you. both adorable experts. There is no other, I mean, honestly, I'm not saying this just because I have one line. They have a billion designers and talents involved in both of these companies, but, um, but um, they're just really like solid. Yeah. Like family, we're, Shade Store just sold. Kravitz still family owned, obviously, but, um, but I mean, what, what they're absolute experts, you know, so um, they, they, the Shade Store really doesn't have competition. Mm. They, it was the mom and pop, you know, local, that sign, draperies, yeah. you know, um, but, and Kravit has just been unbelievable to work with and their archive in Beth Page should be a field trip for everyone at NYSID. They, you guys should all just pack a lunch and go right now. Cause it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's unbelievable. When we started this line, that broken sort of bricked pattern, I have a real hard time with multicolor textiles designing them, it's really hard for me. Um, I'm much better with two or three color and they're like, you need a multicolor, you need a multicolor. And that was a, 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 a like a, a, nine, a late nine, 19, late 18th century, early 19th, late 19th century, um, right before like the Viennese secessionist mm. movement. And I was they're like, well, what periods are you interested in? And I was like, I was really fascinated by the Viennese secessionist movement. And literally they were like, and like all of a sudden stuff, like it was like, like, like robots. Like I was like, they were like, what about this? What about that? We could recreate this and change the scale. And so we got to it, but it's um, super handsome. It's really cool on like a, a 1950s, like Jean-Michel Frank kind of style club chair. Cause it, the, all the lines line up in a really great way. The welting, just FYI in case anyone wants to spec it. <laughs> Good to, good to know. Okay, 60 seconds, tell us the reality of working on a licensing deal or, or really partnering with somebody, yeah. right? Um, so it's not, um, it's certainly glamorous, like in, in some ways, obviously you get to stand and go and you know, promote it and all that. Um, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of um, concessions. Mm. It's a lot of marrying artistry with efficiency. It's a lot of listening and hearing a lot of people's opinions about things that are gonna have your name on them. Mm. And that's how I think it should be. Um, it's not a dictatorial kind of um, relationship. Um, you come in with your point of view, they tell you what they think in their expertise will sell, then you marry that with the manufacturing capabilities and the sourcing capabilities, and you end up with something that you're still proud of that looks nothing like what you walked in with the first time. <laughs> And that is the truth. And that's the reality. Yeah, I, we, right? I used to sit in the basement of Target in Minnesota at their headquarters with the towel buyer. And we'd have, we had 50 linear feet of towels. And we would change the colors every, I don't even remember what that schedule was, but my, maybe once a year, twice a year. And I would say to the buyer, well, what do you think is going to work? Because we would provide, obviously, the, the Pantone colors. And I would say, well, what do you think is gonna work? And they'd say, we really love that, like, lavender. Do, are we being invaded? Me? Oh, it is. Oh. Uh, it's oh. like someone's breaking through the ceiling, guys. We should, oh. somebody, we yeah. should address this. Um, but um, anyway, and I finally, she'd say, I really love that, you know, lavender. And I would go, well, I hate it, but, <laughs> If you think it's going to sell, let's see. And if it's in the top three, I'll take you to Manny's Steakhouse for dinner. And if it's in the bottom three, I'm never listening to you again. Mm. <laughs> so it, that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Good synopsis there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, we're tight for time. So who in the audience wants to ask a question? Way up in the front here. We've got two hands way up in the front. All right. Let's see. And we've got hands over there. Okay. First question, lots of pressure. Um, uh, should I stand? I don't know who matters. Um, stand, my sit, question is, is just speaking to that microphone. Oh, oh yeah, that's, sorry. That's here you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, my question for you is, um, like, you are such an icon <clears throat> in the industry in a million ways, and we all know, you know that. We all know that. Um, the question, though, is, as someone who's starting out in the industry, something I get asked all the time is, like, what do you want to do in ten years? So what do you want to do in 10 years? 
Mm. First of all, I, I hate that question that you ask of young people. <laughs> I know, I'm not, sorry. No, I, I hate when people ask that of young people because you're not supposed to know that. Yeah, you're supposed he to didn't look know that. At, I didn't know that. And you're supposed to just take whatever opportunities and put your best foot forward yeah. and, and make it matter to you. And, and I think that that's a really weird thing to judge somebody on. I don't even know what I want my hair to look like in 10 years, let alone like, you know. Um, I'd like to sell my brand within 10 years. I'd like to be, I'd like to gently exit out of everything I've built over the last 30 years. And, um, you know, my mother always says to me, they're going to put your name on a toilet brush. And I'm, and I say to her, I hope they do. So. Let them. So yeah. that's where he wants to be in 10 years. Yeah. Retired. Yeah. Retired. Yeah. yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Over here. Hey, Nate Berkus, how you doing today? Good. Very good. My name's Erin. Um, so I'm a student here at NYSED, yeah. and I live in New Jersey, and I work at a small local showroom. Okay. So my question to you, it's almost a two-part question, is one, how do you manage and deal with budgeting, and which type of like furniture pieces do you pick certain ones that you put more money towards, or does it depend on the client or the family? How do you manage your budgeting skills? Oh, um, sorry if I threw you off guard there. <laughs> oh, um, I'm really not good at it. So the project managers and the designers that are attached to that project keep me honest about that. Um, I'm so bad that sometimes I'll be like, let's just not charge them commission on that piece because that has to be the piece. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Like, it's a business. I'm like, I know, but that sideboard is like, but. Um, <laughs> You know, we, I would say it, it, it's, it's totally dependent on the client, and we, we do try to be, no, first of all, people telling you their budget is a, like a big lie. Can I just let you know that? Because no one understands what anything costs. So when somebody calls you and says, oh, I have $10,000 to spend on this room, they, they're going to spend way more than that, because they're going to fall in love with things over the things, and you'll make more money, and they'll be happier, and... There's not like a budget like that is like for TV shows. Um, in real life, it's about prioritizing and getting to know them well enough and asking the right questions and figuring out what they're cheap about and what they really get excited about. Because, you know, that's why all that weird art sells in all those travel destinations. Because, you know, people are like, we're on vacation. Blah, let's buy this weird fake painting of a mountain range or whatever. <laughs> And you know it's all awful, and then they regret it when they get home. But if you take the time to get to know them and understand, like they would never spend two hundred dollars on a pillow, but they certainly would spend five thousand dollars on a mirror. That's information that you can use to assemble an interior that really rises up to greet them, which is always the goal. And eighty percent of what we spec for our clients that's not custom is um, is old. Old, vintage or antique, old. I'm, I'm really like, you know, I don't like anyone's dirty mattress, obviously. Um, and I have a tough time even with vintage upholstery because I, I feel like you really have to really redo that. Like, you know, I don't like a dust mite or a bed bug or any of that business joining the party. But 80% but, but at least is vintage or antique. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. On the other side of the room. All right. Oh my gosh, well, I'm actually from Lake Forest originally, so. Oh my, I still have speeding oh. tickets there. Oh my, oh. It's, <laughs> like, I grew up there, now I live in New York, but that's so funny. Um, okay, so I obviously love antiquing and the idea of designing for clients, but I also really want to design, like, spaces. I volunteer at a homeless shelter, and, like, I just love the idea of, like, designing a space to, like, help people in a time of need. So in designing those spaces, how do you kind of, interpret the space differently or what do you do when designing space for people that need it differently than just the average client you know you don't first of all like because isn't that isn't that what really matters in 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 for everything in everything that we do to figure out how you can use what you love to give back which is incredible and you sound like you're nine, but I'm sure you're older than that. <laughs> and I can't see you because they dim the lights. Um, but you know, the answer is you don't. The answer is you don't change the way you do things at all when you're working with people in need or people with um, special needs or people um, affiliated with a charity or an organization. And the reason why I say you don't change it is because 
you, you should be paying the same amount of attention to the billionaire someday as you are to the person who can't afford a sofa. And you should, you should advocate for the best design and the best quality things that you can, regardless of who you're working for. And so don't change your style or your system, or you, know, you might have to be a little craftier in terms of sourcing, but that's okay. But you know, keep it all, all at the same level. Do, do yourself proud, do them proud. Okay, good, good. yes, oh my gosh. Yes, uh, so I've been sitting here, I was considering asking you how you made eggs taste like nothing, but. Um, <laughs> I actually don't know the answer to Yeah, that. that's pretty Apparently impressive, Apparently it's actually. just like a truism in our house, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a student here at NYSED, I have two weeks left. Wow. wow. Um, and uh, I, my background is in graphic design and I've like established my career as a creative strategist. And so now in two weeks, I feel like I'm at this crossroads where I'm like, do I pursue something that's new or do I, you know, stick to what I've been doing? And I guess that my question is, have you been at any kind of similar crossroads and what do you look to to help you make that decision? That's a really fair question, and I think that that question represents what a lot of people are experiencing right before they graduate. What I wish for everyone is that they took the internships and tried it out, and you know, like even for myself, like I wish I went and worked for an estate jeweler so I wouldn't buy dumb things on live auctioneers in the middle of the night. Um, He's working through that. I am. Okay? Uh, thank you guys for being my support yeah, group yeah. for this. It's been We're here really, for you. I'm Nate Burkus, and I. Yeah. Um, but I, <laughs> I have I a jewelry problem. I do appreciate yeah. your empathy. Um, I I I think that. I think if you're asking that question, that that might not be the path that you'll end up on, because I think if there's a curiosity about what else is out there and it's not what's driving you every day to wake up and be like, I've got to get into this. This is exactly what I, I know I should be doing. I think your question to me is probably more telling than my answer to you. And I think I would just remain, if I were you, I'd remain really, really open to networking, to meeting people, um, just to, you know, don't just interview with companies that do that. You know, you're a creative person you have a great education, you have something to contribute. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in your field. Um, so um, I don't think you can define your field yet. Okay. We got, we got a wrap, right? We got a tight out? Oh, there is? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, though. One last question, Yeah. Well, uh, it's gotta be a quick question, but really quick, because I'm getting the, the, hard, the hard out on the... Uh, super, super quick. Oh, um, quick. I'm actually the wife of a student, um, and she is a career changer in her mid-30s. And so what advice do you have for people trying to get their foot in the door in a new industry, um, not just right out of college as in the early 20s? So the interesting thing, and we were talking about this <laughs> yesterday, about, about the, like, that breakdown of student body. Um, you have the people who are coming here you know, in their early 20s, and then you have the people I think your example was like the dental dentist yes, didn't work out. Yes, we have out. former dentists here yeah, at the school yeah. who, hello. Yeah, I mean, amazing. Yeah, so you know, right I here. think I, you know, with the, I think the incredible thing about design as an industry is that because of that, because it's flexed to accommodate um, people who have decided that that's their passion after trying out something else. I think that there's a lot of. Um, I think you're going to find a lot of of people open to interviewing you and, and potentially hiring you or working with you. Um, I don't think the design industry has that stigma at all. I think that you don't have to be 22 to walk into a design firm and apply for a job. I actually, I think you can, I, you know, in fact, some of the people that have worked with me the longest, one worked for a fashion magazine here in New York and one worked for a wedding planner. And I was like, if you dealt with the deadlines of a fashion magazine, you're in, and if you figured out how to like throw off an installation, um, it, you know, of the most important day of of people's lives, um, yeah, I'll try you too. So I think I don't think I don't I don't think you have to worry. I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nate Burkers has to go, but will you please thank him and